Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today's Warrior Chat. I'm Wayne McCullough, the Chief Financial and Operations Officer for the Southern York County School District. We have some very important information that we want to share with you regarding unfunded and underfunded mandates that public schools in Pennsylvania face. I think this is important information for you. Um, we shared this information with a community advisory group that meet with our superintendent on a monthly basis in the fall. and almost unanimously members of the advisory group thought, you know, this is information all of our public should hear. So that's why we're sharing, with it, sharing it with you. So again, thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Uh, just another comment that I think is important. This is not a political commentary by any means. There's no talking points. Uh, there's no discussion related to necessarily what's good or bad. Uh, but it is important information because I know you pick up the paper and you read how the funding of public education in Pennsylvania and probably throughout most of the United States uh, during a recessionary period, but uh, particularly in Pennsylvania because it deals with us here on the local level, has reached crisis levels. Uh, and I think it's important the public understands where their hard-earned tax dollars go, uh, particularly when it comes to what we commonly refer to as unfunded mandates, which I'd like to broaden that topic today to underfunded mandates too. Mandates the public schools face. Again, not necessarily any of them are bad. Most of them uh, probably we all would agree with are important for our children to be successful uh, throughout their lives and particularly to keep them safe. Uh, during their time here as students for us. But uh, again, not necessarily that they're good or bad, but that the funding stream does not always follow uh, the mandate as it's received, sometimes from the federal government, sometimes from the state government. But we want to share these with you today. So again, thank you so much uh, for being with you. The real problem is simply this, and that's that public school funding subsidy uh, from all levels, which primarily, again, would be state and federal level, has not kept pace with the mandates. And what that means, uh, I'll give you an example later on, but I want to say it now because I think it's something you need to continue to hear. In the mid-1970s, over 50% of subsidy funding for public education at a local level here in Pennsylvania came from state sources. Now that level, as we prepare the 2014-15 budget, has dropped below 30%. So where does the rest of that funding made up? And unfortunately, it's made up at a very unpopular local level in the form of real estate taxes. Uh, and we agree, real estate taxes are not a fair system of taxation probably uh, for all residents. It impacts different res residents differently. Uh, but again, the problem is that the state and federal subsidy, the funding for public education has not kept pace uh, with the mandates that have followed with them. And you'll see some of those as we talk about it today. Primarily, number one would be the topic of charter schools. Uh, again, I'm sure you've heard in the news about charter schools, cyber charter schools, and that is a law where st children uh, who, who choose, their families choose the option for them to attend, in our case at Southern York County School District, cyber charter schools, uh, that we as a local school district are required to pay the tuition for those children. And that tuition ranges from a regular education child to slightly more than $10,000 to a special education child to almost $21,000. Uh, and here's what I consider the kind of the bugaboo, and that is that that same tuition rate, for example, is a rate that a local school district would charge for a child who attends a brick and mortar charter school as a child who would attend a cyber charter school. And obviously we believe uh, that the cyber school cost would not be the same as a brick and mortar charter school, uh, uh, so to speak, in a traditional sense of a child attending a building to, to go to school. Uh, the calculation is based on this. Uh, for example, it's based on instructional expense, which again makes sense. So our actual instructional expense that we have for our faculty and staff uh, and textbooks and supplies to teach our children. Uh, it's also including extracurricular expenses that we would provide our children with opportunities to do co-curricular and extracurricular activities. But in addition to that, it includes the calculation for payment to cyber charter school students, uh, includes our operation and maintenance costs, including utilities, nurses, librarians, guidance services, and I mention those in particular because 
they would not be expenses that would be incurred, particularly operations and maintenance, uh, nursing costs uh, at the cyber school level. So again, not necessarily a bad that children have a choice. I, I, think, I, th I think it is good in my mind that families and children have a choice of what's appropriate for them in terms of an education. But again, uh, the fact that public schools are required to pay tuition for those children and a tuition calculation that's built on expenses that are not necessarily realistic expenses that are incurred by that charter school or, or cyber charter school uh, is where we believe it gets out of whack. One example is what you may have heard in the news is a double dip, that charter schools are able to double dip into uh, the funding stream. And that particularly is, for example, school districts for employees are required to pay into uh, the Pennsylvania system of education retirement system. Uh, and then what happens is Pennsylvania then reimburses school districts half of that cost. Well, we're, cyber schools are double dipping into that as a, in terms of funding because uh, they are getting, based on our tuition rate that we're paying them, our cost uh, that we're paying and then they're getting reimbursed back. So it's just, again, one example where the funding of that formula does not necessarily match their actual uh, expense. Uh, and, and here's probably the other catch. And that is that none of Pennsylvania cyber schools in 2012-2013 met federally mandated academic performance standards. Uh, and I think that's important because at a local level we're paying tuition uh, for an educational opportunity for students to attend cyber charter schools that aren't meeting academic performance targets the same that we are required to meet and want to meet, obviously for the good of our students. So I think we'd all agree um, from a business standpoint only, from a financial standpoint, we believe here at Southern York County School District, uh, from a business standpoint, uh, we're giving you value for the dollar, that our children are very successful in our performance standards. We're ranked always in the top of tier of York County. In fact, recent data shows that again. Uh, but yet at the cyber school level, the children who are attending cyber schools outside of our district aren't meeting the same performance standards. Uh, the Pennsylvania Auditor General, and I think this statistic is alarming, based on some of the things I've shared with you in terms of how that funding formula is developed, that Pennsylvania taxpayers are paying more than $365 million more uh, than what should be paid for those true operational costs of those schools uh, and is advocating, the Auditor General is advocating that this fund funding formula is fixed. Now there is some, there is some work going on in legislator, uh, through our legislators in uh, Pennsylvania to correct that. Um, uh, nothing has been passed at this point. We're under that same funding formula. Uh, I do want to show you this chart. I think it's important because it shows since 2010-11 uh, how our costs have gone up. When I say our costs, it's our community's cost. It's a cost that everyone in our community is paying for, again, uh, students to attend cyber charter schools. Again, it's now reaching almost $800,000. But, but here again, a catch. You see in 2010-11, uh, the state's commitment was to reimburse local school districts for some of that cost. In fact, you see that we were reimbursed almost hundred and about $130,000 or so in 2010, 2011. Well, 2011, 12, the state now, which mandates for us to pay that tuition has not reimbursed, stopped the process of reimbursing local school districts for that cost. So all of that cost now becomes uh, the burden of local school districts uh, and obviously, again, passed on to local taxpayers. Uh, so I think that that slide shows an alarming increase of costs, again, a mandate of the state without local, without subsidy to help pay for the cost uh, of that um, cost. Uh, so, I, I'm a firm believer of this, and I, I'm sure you probably would uh, share that with me. Uh, you know, it's one thing to state a problem, but another thing to probably give some solutions. So, I'm also going to offer, uh, if you can bear with me, what I believe are some possible solutions uh, based on uh, this problem. And, and the first would be that, you know, uh, if we have children and families who opt in that type of educational uh, experience, 
uh, then I think that cost should be based actually on their cost. Uh, so our tuition payment to them, my recommendation would be that we pay them based on the actual cost to educate the children and not on a funding formula that includes services uh, that they're, they're not providing. And then also that the pension double dip is not part of the calculation. Uh, so again, if we do reimburse uh, cyber charter schools, uh, my recommendation would be that it's based on their actual expense and not based on a formula that includes, for example, operation and maintenance costs and uh, utility costs and so forth, costs that they are not incurring. Uh, also, I think there should be uh, appropriate mechanisms in place for the oversight of the educational process uh, in charter schools and hold them accountable uh, for their educational programs that they meet standards that just like other public schools uh, would be to meet. Uh, and then finally, uh, the charter schools should be responsible for the inaccuracy or overpayment that are made. Uh, right now, the burden of proof that a child is a resident of our school district and would attend a cyber charter school becomes the burden of the local school district and not the burden of the cyber charter school to prove uh, that they're not. So, uh, and then finally also that school districts are held responsible for the truancy of children in cyber charter schools. And again, my recommendation would be that the cyber charter schools, because the ch child has opted uh, and is attending their, their school, that they would be held accountable uh, for that. We'll move on to special education. Uh, as you can imagine, special education is highly mandated uh, by both the federal government and state law to meet the needs of all of our children. And again, that is a responsibility uh, that we not only accept, but we embrace totally. Uh, we do here, obviously, at Southern York County School District want to educate every child. And we will, I promise you, we stand committed to educate every child uh, in our district that walks through our doors. That's a very, very important priority of ours. So it's not uh, uh, the mandate is not that we're against, obviously, educating and meeting the needs of all children. We want to. In fact, we embrace the opportunity to meet the needs uh, in all children. Uh, the catch is, again, that the state, uh, primarily in the federal funding system, no longer supports meeting some extraordinary needs of some of our special education uh, children. Uh, here's just an example, and I'll ask our folks here in our Warrior TV studio to show this slide. Uh, and I won't read every point to you, but I just want to give you a sense of some of the special education costs and some of the special education mandates uh, uh, that are imposed upon schools. For example, uh, the concept of a free and appropriate public education for all children. And again, we embrace that concept. All children should have a free and appropriate public education. Uh, children should be placed in the least restrictive environment. I've heard, I'm sure you've heard of that. Uh, when at all possible, we want to include all children in a general education curriculum, uh, but also specifically design an educational program for that child. You hear of the IEP, and that's what that is, an individual educational program for, for the children who have that, that need. Uh, we are, we are uh, part of that need, part of that individual educational program may include occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language therapy, uh, obviously transportation, special transportation if they're not able to ride a, a bus or if, they're, uh, or if they need to be educated outside of the border of our school district, different psychological services, nursing services, some of them have special care assistance and instructional assistance. Again, uh, the concept is that these are needs of the children and we want to be able to providing them and meet their needs, but the subsidy does not necessarily follow it. Uh, we are mandated to provide extended school year for children who may have that need in order to reach, sta reach standards, to provide homebound services uh, and certainly assistive technology uh, if needed to help them in the classroom uh, and so forth for the children. Uh, but here's, here's what it means in a dollar sense and in terms of subsidy. When I talk about underfunded mandate, and that's what this is, this is underfunded. You'll see since 2007, 2008, how our special education costs to educate the children uh, who have special education needs have, have risen from about four and a half million to just over six million. So over that course, of five to six years, we've increased about a million and a half dollars. But during the same time, subsidy has been frozen. There has been no increase in special education subsidy to school districts during that time. Uh, so again, uh, what's happened is the burden 
uh, to meet the mandates that are provided by the state and federal governments as it relates to special education has increasingly been placed on the local school districts. And when I say local school districts, again, on the local taxpayer. I think this slide shows you very graphically how special education costs have increased, but, have in, but how subsidy has ma maintained flat uh, over the course of this time. Again, uh, let's not just complain if we don't give uh, any helpful hints of what we can do to improve it. Uh, but the General Assembly, again, must address this critical problem. When I say General Assembly, I'm talking about the legislators in, here in Pennsylvania and Harrisburg. The state budget to public schools for appropriation of special education subsidy to public schools has not changed since the 2008-2009 budget. Uh, as you can see, the mandates have increased and certainly the costs have increased. Uh, for the local school districts. Uh, it is my belief that school districts should be reimbursed at least half of the cost of the special education instruction. Uh, again, that would release the burden from the local taxpayer uh, for that cost. Student transportation is another area that there's been underfunded mandates. Uh, for example, and when I said this to the community advisory committee members, some of them uh, just didn't realize this was a mandate that we're faced with, and that is uh, that we are required as a public school district at Southern York County School District, but it's all school districts in the state of Pennsylvania, are required to provide transportation services for children who attend, who elect to attend, private schools within 10 miles of our border. So we do. We provide private school transportation to children who attend your country day school, St. Joseph's School in Dallastown, Redline Christian School, St. Joseph's School of Hanover, and Old Path Christian Academy. Uh, the cost for us is approximately $75,000 annually. Again, a mandate uh, that is underfunded here in Pennsylvania. Our recommendation would be this, uh, that we were be only provided, we would only be required to provide transportation services to children who attend private schools within our borders. Uh, it's very expensive to provide transportation outside our borders. Uh, sometimes only a few children in a vehicle to transport them. So uh, the recommendation uh, that I would have is let's, let's, okay, let's transport children who live in our district and attend schools in our district, whether they're public or private. Uh, I think that would be a reasonable expectation. Uh, and then also to require that, uh, that we would only provide transportation on days that are similar to our calendar. Currently, we have to provide transportation to these uh, private schools based on their calendars. Um, again, a couple, su a couple suggestions, I, and I, I, I want to say it again. I, I don't want this to be a political commentary, and, uh, but I do want our public to be aware of some of these very, very important underfunded or unfunded mandates that are faced on public schools. Uh, one is prevailing wage. There has been some recent action to improve this, but the 50-year prevailing wage law, 50-year-old uh, prevailing wage law here in Pennsylvania is the school districts pay a prevailing wage, an inflated wage, uh, on all construction projects that exceed $25,000. There is movement to change that. Uh, but if it was just changed for inflation only, that amount would be about $175,000. And I estimate that would save us at a local level about 20% on construction projects. Uh, when you look at a Friendship Elementary School project that we recently completed around, uh, you know, around a $15 million project, well, at a local level, can you imagine that that may have saved us $3 million plus uh, at a local level uh, by not having to do prevailing wage? Uh, and we obviously take very, uh, very seriously uh, our uh, fiduciary responsibility to maintain a, a very strong and an updated physical plant. So every summer we do projects and some of them are just repaving and re-roofing and some HVAC projects inside buildings. But again, if we wouldn't have to pay prevailing wage uh, at that level, at that threshold of 25,000, again, there is movement to change that uh, until it reached uh, an inflationary level at least of 180,000. Uh, it would save us considerable amount of money here at the local level. Very important issue. Uh, so the recommendation would be to raise the threshold. I think it would be okay to allow school districts at a local level to opt out of the prevailing wage law. Let us decide at the local level whether we want to participate in a prevailing wage program uh, or not. And then finally, uh, another thing that school districts are required to do is to award multiple prime contracts. And here's the example. 
uh, at a Friendship Elementary School project, or it could, it could be any project. But we have to award uh, a general contract, an electrical contract, a plumbing contract, an HVAC contract. Uh, so we have to award multiple prime contracts. And that does cost additional money because there's extreme coordination efforts that have to take place that you can imagine uh, to coordinate the, the construction efforts based on having multiple contracts. There is no contractor ultimately responsible for scheduling and oversight of all these prime contractors. So that now becomes the burden of the school district to provide that. Uh, we are fortunate that we have uh, Mr. Randall Buffington, our director of operations, who has extreme experience in co contract management and prime contract management and construction management but but many school districts spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on projects to manage them to coordinate the efforts of these multiple con prime con of multiple contracts uh, so a recommendation I would have uh, is that school districts are allowed to, ha to award these contracts to a single prime contractor to alleviate uh, the scheduling and so forth and then finally as you can imagine uh, we've been fortunate because we've been able to do projects without litigation. Uh, but there's been many local school districts and certainly throughout the state who've been involved in construction projects that, that become involved in huge litigation processes. Uh, and many of them are a result of the fact that they have to issue multiple prime contracts in a, in a project and the coordination of that becomes very difficult. Uh, the responsibility of it becomes 100% a burden on the school district. Uh, as opposed to a contractor on site, a general contractor, uh, for example, who would be responsible for the entire contract in coordination of the timing and the efforts to get that work done. Again, I, I mention that because I think probably many people are not aware of that. Some other examples of, of underfunded, uh, unfunded mandates, teacher principal evaluations uh, that are new, you'll hear more about that, keystone exams, uh, exams at the local level. Uh, just this year, uh, increased very burdensome disclosure of interscholastic athletic opportunities uh, and reporting that relates to that. Uh, again, very important. Title IX, very important for equal opportunity for all of our children, including males and females. We all agree with that. But burdensome reporting requirements become a timely and costly uh, mandate from the state. Child abuse reporting training, we just recently required at the local level to, to have extensive training for all employees for child abuse reporting. Again, all good, but the mandate in, in terms of mandating the length of time and the reporting requirements uh, in terms of paperwork and so forth uh, becomes burdensome uh, and costly. Uh, PIMS, TIMS, which is the Pennsylvania Inter Information Management System, a continued data that collection that is shared with the state from the local level to the state level. Uh, again, none of this bad, just costly and timely and takes staffing to do so. Common Core, uh, you've heard much, much about on the news uh, uh, with the direction being placed on having a common educational core standards for all students, not just in Pennsylvania, but perhaps throughout the United States is continued push and we'll hear more about, I'm sure, in the next year and so and so forth. And then finally, uh, uh, CPR training mandated uh, and so forth. So I just mentioned these again, none of them are bad, just examples. Uh, I mentioned this early, but here's, here's the overarching problem, is uh, the funding formula that currently is used here in Pennsylvania drives out a funding range in public schools from $883 at one public school in Pennsylvania to over $59,000 to another, and this was 2010-11 data. Uh, and here at Southern York, uh, here's what it means to us. If we would have received the average funding amount, if there was a magical, here's the amount we're going to give per student dollar value in Pennsylvania, we would have received $3 million more than our subsidy payment currently drives out. Very significant money. Uh, and in fact, uh, over the last few years would have allowed us not to have any local tax increase at all had we received just the average amount of funding uh, that was provided to other local public school districts in the state of Pennsylvania. And then finally, I did mention this. Uh, the, the funding formula does not, does not correlate to the number of students uh, or the actual cost for public schools. Uh, it's very outdated and needs to be updated. Again, there is some movement in Pennsylvania uh, to try to get something done there, and let's hope they do. Uh, and then finally, I mentioned this, but 
uh, the state's funding, the state's commitment to public education has decreased from the mid-1970s to over 50 percent uh, to this current year at about 30 percent, 30.1 percent here at the local level. And, and as we begin to plan our budget for next year, uh, falling for the first time ever uh, to below 30 percent from state level. And again, where does that come from? Well, you know where it comes from. Uh, it comes from the local taxpayer, again, in the very unpopular form of, of real estate taxes, unfortunately. We wanted to share some of this information with you, and uh, maybe I covered it quicker than I should, or maybe I just bored you to death. I'm not sure which one. Uh, but uh, here's, if you have any questions, please, what I'd like you to do is call us here at the school district and ask to speak with me, Wayne McCullough. Uh, I'm happy to speak with you and meet individually with you, meet with you at groups to share some of this information with you. I think it's important uh, that our public is aware of where their hard-earned money uh, goes. Finally, I'll leave you with this. Uh, I'm a resident of Southern York County School District. My children attend here, obviously, and have attended here. Uh, we're committed to spend every dollar that you provide us in your hard-earned money in a good way, to do it efficiently and effectively, and to make sure that our resources go directly to our children in the form of the best educational program possible here at the Southern York County School District. That's my promise to you, and I promise you we'll keep that. Um, so, for Ali Kerr, who's working the camera here, Mr. Tim Harris, uh, video production class, visit, uh, video marketing class for Mr. Mark Brill, uh, our director, our coordinator of marketing and public information, I'm Wayne McCullough. I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for being with us.